thank you so much for checking out this episode review. I hope y'all having a good weekend over there. I'm just hanging out over here. <laughs> if this is your first time here, thank you for checking out this video. Welcome to the family. I'm Miss T. So, the shy. This episode was very good. I was intrigued. <laughs> I was definitely intrigued. It was a pretty good episode. So, let's jump right in. Let's talk a little bit about Mr. Brandon. Mr. Brandon is exhausted. He's absolutely exhausted because he's been prepping for the aftertaste and he's been working long hours on the food truck. So the episode opens up. He's about to burn the whole damn, whole damn house down. <laughs> Jerrica walks in and saves him from that. And we get to see that Brandon is holding a lot of anger in him. He's mad about the fact that Ronnie basically walked free for killing his brother Kooji. And not only that, he's starting to feel just unsure about himself. Really unsure about himself. He's just been catching hell on all sides. But Jerrica gives him some encouraging words and that's what we need our significant others for, to be our backbone when we just can't pull ourselves up. She tells him that if he just calms his nerves, he actually have a pretty good shot at winning the aftertaste. And I agree. I agree. So with that being said, Brandon allows Emmett to hold down the fort, hold down the taco truck while he's prepping for the aftertaste. I don't know about that because Emmett kind of accident prone, but you know, good luck with that. So later in the episode, we find Brandon. He's at the aftertaste. He's doing the damn thing. However, he soon realized that he forgot his plates back at the house. He calls Jerrica to see if she can, you know, run them up there real quick. And she's not able to do that because she's out doing her real estate thing, you know. <laughs> so, Brandon is able to use a little game to finesse the judges. He was able to take the rejection and the bad experiences that he's been having so far and turn it into game. And I think that's what life is all about. We can't look at rejection and bad experiences as failures. We got to learn. We got to look at it as if they are life lessons to be used further down the line. You know, wisdom. So basically... Brandon tells the judges about his grandfather and how he was a portman puller, I believe. And even though he worked really, really hard, he never missed a meal with his wife, his family. And that was some of that game that he got from the lady that didn't hire him. She told him that his food needed to tell a story. So he used that and finessed the judges. So he didn't have plates. But since his grandpa used to eat right out the pot, he called it family style. <laughs> they went ahead. They went along with it and they ate the food right out the pot. I couldn't believe he pulled it off, but you know, <laughs> they went for it. I think he made some chili beef a la broche or something like that, but it must have been damn good because he made it to the semifinals. So, hey, there you have it. You know, when life is throwing a whole bunch of crazy stuff at you, you can't give up. You got to keep pushing towards the mark. And you know, it might be something beautiful on the other side. So good luck to Brandon. I know that's right. So Brandon's side story is with Jerrica. Jerrica is working with a lady named Miss Brown. She's trying to get her apartments up and running. However, she doesn't want to rent to low income families. It's her money. It's her business. She can do whatever she wants to do. So, Mr. Bonner, I'm not sure if he's a friend of Jerrica's family or a mentor of some sort, but he is not feeling what Jerrica is doing at all. And it's basically calling her a sellout. You know, it's the whole gentrification thing, pushing the black people out and allowing the more wealthy people, white people, to move into the neighborhood. I can see both sides of it. Jerrica was arguing that it's an opportunity for the upper middle class black people to move into these apartments and he was arguing that you and I both know damn well that's not going to happen. The poor people are going to get pushed out. I see both sides of the argument. 
you know I really do however generally upper middle class black people like once black people get some money most of the time we move out of the hood it is what it is and from what we've been seeing most of the time when the neighborhood starts to get gentrified the black people get pushed out so I don't know what the answer is I really don't but we can't expect Miss Brown to save the whole damn hood I just don't know guys I, I really don't know what the answer is there so let's talk about Ronnie for a minute Ronnie is out of jail he's a free man child killer but free man he goes to visit Miss Ethel and she's so excited to see him I am glad that they got the chance to reunite or whatever Ronnie goes back to her house because her house is in disarray after the invasion and attack. He starts to clean up and he finds some liquor bottles underneath the sink. I didn't know what Ryan was going to do, but uh, he poured them out. He poured out all three of the liquor bottles and good for him. At the end of last week's episode, I just wasn't so sure about Ronnie. I thought he was just going to succumb to being an alcoholic but he's taking steps he's taking strides to overcome this addiction so kudos to Ronnie next thing we find Ronnie and Tracy and she's looking a damn mess the house is a mess she's a mess and who wouldn't be who wouldn't be a mess after the death of their child I, I feel bad for her I, I, I really do. I know that's got to be a, a tough thing to do, but Ronnie insists that he's going to help her bounce back. He tells her that since he's been in jail, he's had some time to really reflect on his life. And he knows it's time to make changes. It's way past due. It's way past due. So Tracy tells him that Shantae had the baby. She was pregnant by her son. And... She doesn't want to go see the baby yet because, you know, it's bad enough that she's seeing Jason everywhere and other people when she hears a song. I can imagine it's very hard, but she doesn't want to see the baby because it's just going to be kind of like the nail in the coffin, so to speak, that her son is really gone. And she just can't deal with that. I, I totally get it. Ronnie is able, I guess, to convince her to go over to see Shantae and the baby Jordan. And she was overjoyed. She was really overjoyed when she saw that baby, just seeing Jason's likeness in the baby. So maybe that's going to help mend her heart a little bit. I, I certainly hope so. So then lastly, Ronnie, he's walking down the street buying baby stuff for the baby Jordan and he runs into a lady whose son was also killed and the killer went free or they weren't able to catch him and she wants to represent all the mothers that are going through something like that and she spits in his face spits in his face and I imagine that Ronnie is going to be going through that a lot you know even though he got himself together he can't ignore the fact that he is hurt a lot of people by what he did so I hope he ready for that backlash so on to Emmett baby boy <laughs> baby boy still catching hell he back at uh, Sonny's chicken pit he having problems with the employees still he done started a grease fire in the kitchen and his ass throw water on it and just burn down the whole damn kitchen he's still catching hell <laughs> He is still catching hell. So with that being said, he's out of a job. He's out of a job. So he goes over to see his baby mom, Tiff. You know, they got busy last episode, whatever. I hope she ain't pregnant. But anyway, he wants Tiff to drop the child support order for a while while he gets himself together. And she ain't trying to hear that. I, I don't blame her, you know, like the child still need money. I understand it's rough, but from my understanding, Tiff been catching hell getting money out of Emmett for the longest. So, no, we're not going to end the order. You're just going to have to hustle. And that's what Emmett does. He goes to Brandon and makes a proposition about him getting a percentage of his taco truck money if he sets up shop in front of the chicken, <clears throat> the chicken pit. 
Brandon wasn't feeling it at first, but he does, you know, come up with like a counter offer for them both to make some money. So that works out. So Emmett does give Tiff a little something to hold on to until he's able to come up with some money. So I can see Emmett, he is growing up. He getting his shit together. So in the midst of him doing all of this hustling and whatnot, he's selling hair in his father's kitchen. And Darnell, he ain't going for that. <laughs> he's like, I don't want no strange people in my house. You can't have hair in my kitchen. And I know that's right. I'm the same damn way. Get that hair out my kitchen. And in the midst of that, we find out that Emmett has only been there two weeks. He already won't rent. He ain't playing no damn games with Emmett's ass. I don't blame him. Emmett need all of that tough love, for real. So next, Jada and Darnell meet up. Jada is Emmett's mother. And Darnell got the audacity to ask for a little money since Emmett is staying with him. These fathers... Some of these fathers, some of these fathers, man, and this child support. His argument was since he had to pay child support to her when Emmett was younger, she should be doing the same thing. And she makes it very clear. Like, you had a thousand kids. Do you think that child support money was really doing anything to really help me? Then on top of that, he wasn't around. So it's like, you, I'm barely getting any money. And then you're not even being active in your son's life. Yet you have the audacity to come over here after two weeks of your son staying with you and ask for money. I can't. I, I, I just cannot. So that right there just let me know that Darnell still got a little baby boy in him too. We also found out that um, Darnell was 25 with three kids and he was letting her know like you knew what you was getting into with me when we started this whole thing and I can't knock him there like us as women we do have to make better choices in men. If, uh, I was about to say the word. If a man is showing you who he is and that he's not responsible and he just laying seeds down everywhere. We, we got to do better. We got to make better choices. I digress. So I want to talk about the kids. Kev, Papa, and Jake. They're getting ready for picture day. And Jake is already talking about either he's going to be throwing up some gang signs or wearing gang insignia. And I'm like, Lord, I wish somebody would step in Jake's life at this moment right now. If so many children are at that pivotal age where they could go into one lifestyle or the other and I think that's where Jake is. I wish he could have a positive mentor step in his life and show him a better way because the road that he headed down now it's only going to lead to one of two places you know dead or in jail. So Papa is trying to explain to him that he shouldn't do this and he needs to start thinking about his future. He is so smart. So smart. It really amazes me that he has that way of thinking at such a young age. And he's totally right. He does. Jake doesn't need to do something like that. He's just messing up his future before he gets started. So Kevin is talking with Maisha about picture day. She's telling Kevin that she cannot miss picture day because she has to be in these pictures so she can put this on her college applications. How smart is Maisha? She is so forward thinking, you know. So I hope that, you know, her mom got her shit together so she don't miss picture day. <laughs> At any rate, picture day finally comes. Papa walks in. He got that drip. He looking real wavy. He looking like Notorious B.I.G. I can't be mad at that. <laughs> I can't be mad at that. Papa got it going on. Then we also find that Kevin has some sort of beef with his dad. He doesn't want to meet up with him for dinner. Later on in the episode, we find out that Kevin's father actually had a heart attack and died. I know that's got to be hard. I know that's got to be hard. It's one thing to beef with your parents for whatever reason, but... For them to die and you were at odds with them in that moment, I'm sure that's really tough. I wonder how Kevin is going to act or act out because of this. Is he not going to care? 
I wonder. I wonder. So lastly, I want to talk about Reg. Reg is everything that is wrong with the black community all rolled up in one little package. He really is. He's the reason why so many of our children are falling victim to the streets. At any rate, Detective Tucson is harassing him. She still feels that he has something, something to do with these home invasions around the hood. So she pays him a little visit and she ends up arresting one of his foot soldiers, Big Mike, for something real petty. I think it was like parking tickets or something like that. So Reg already got his antennas up. He needs to replace Big Mike. He recruits this little husky ass 14 year old. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like these kids are just preyed upon by people like him. Even his brother Jake, you know, he want to be down. He was telling him, no, I can put in work, you know, I got this. He just wants a sense of belonging and unfortunately he's trying to find it in this predator, Reg. It is what it is. So the 14 year old goes down to the detective's office and he tries to take the blame for the invasions. He's not too good at it, and Detective Tucson could already tell he was lying. She ain't no dummy, but look at that. Ranch was willing to have this young man go to jail. He's not thinking about that young man at all. He's just a pawn. Just a pawn. Luckily, the child is 14. He's a juvenile, so most likely he could have he would have got a slap on the wrist, but still. He was able to sacrifice this child with no qualms about it. <sighs> yeah, I hate Reg. Anyway, <laughs> lastly, Reg pays a visit to Duda. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but he pays a visit to Duda and we find out that Duda is actually responsible for setting up the home invasions. He asked Reg to find some outside people to scare Miss Ethel. Of course, they took it too far. They, you know, brutally beat her and whatnot. But he's behind all of this. I wonder. I really wonder what's going on. I don't know. I can't wait to find out. So that was the shy. It was a very good episode, and I think that we're finally starting to put some of the puzzle pieces together. I don't know. I am intrigued. <laughs> So, yeah, let me know what you guys thought about this episode down in the comments. Subscribe if you like the content, and I will see you next time. Peace.